share screen. Have you guys had any problem with um, the recording? I mean, I don't know if anybody's even looked at them, um, if, especially if you're here. Um, but if anybody has any problems with any of that stuff, please let me know, okay? Um, so that I can, so I know that there's something going on. All right, so um, let's figure out where we left off last time. We were, uh, we were talking about plants. We were struggling through doing life cycles in a online format. And we had talked about this transition from being homosporous to heterosporous. And so when we get to our gymnosperms, they're like fully, like they're like no joke heterosporous because now not only do they have totally separate sporangia, megaspores and microspores, but the cones are even separate, right? So whereas in our lycophyte, we've got, you know, different types of sporangia on the same cone, on the same strobilis, right? When we get to our gymnosperms, now they're on completely separate cones. So that's like about as hetero as you can get, <laughs> okay? Um, so that's our gymnosperm life cycle. So um, I talked to a couple of people during office hours um, and they were saying like how hard it is to understand um, the life cycles um, in the book. And it's true, like they're, they're really hard to wrap your brain around, which is why we draw them in kind of a simplified way. Because like, I, you, I don't really care that you know this anatomy in a lot of detail. It's, I'm more concerned that you understand the process of what's happening and where things are going and when we need water and when we don't and all of that kind of stuff, okay? So we were, what were we doing? Okay, here's what we're doing. We were making a, did we make a list? I can't remember, somebody tell me, did we make a list of characteristics of the new hot? No, we didn't. That's right, we didn't make our list for the new hotness for gymnosperms yet, because we were gonna do that today. Sorry, um, <laughs> trying to remember what we did. Um, one thing that we didn't do though, before we do that, that I wanna talk about is we didn't talk about um, variety within gymnosperms. So you might even wanna know, what does that word gymnosperm mean? Okay, so gymnos means, <laughs> this is, this is wild. Gymnos means naked and sperm means seed. Okay. So, and you know, remember my screen is crappy. Um, so gymnosperm, that category literally means naked seed. So these are the plants that have seeds, but they don't have fruit. Okay. Um, and my favorite, the thing that always gives me the giggles when I tell people that gymnos means naked is um, <laughs> the reason that a gymnasium is called a gymnasium is that back in ancient Greece, when you would go to the gymnasium to do your whatever physical activities that you were doing, wrestling lions and I don't know what else, right? Gladiator battles and all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it was a man only space and they were naked. <laughs> So you worked out in the nude back in ancient Greece, evidently. So that's why a gymnasium is called that because people are supposed to be naked there, at least when those were originally named. <laughs> that's a fun fact. Um, so <laughs> the gymnosperms include the conifers, right? We've already talked about that group. All right. Um, so those are our plants with cones. So pine trees, right? Those guys. Um, like cypresses and cedars and anybody with a woody cone is a is a is in that kind of kind of group. Um, then we have cycads. Cycads, phylum cycadophyta, um, is a really interesting group because um, they don't look anything like a pine tree. Like if you look at this thing superficially, it's like that looks more like a palm tree than it looks like a like a pine tree. Um, but it is also a naked seeded plant, right? So it's also a gymnosperm. Um, and then another one of my favorites is our ginkgo, ginkgo biloba. It is the only remaining species in that entire phylum. So once upon a time, there were other ginkgos, but now there is only one species of ginkgos left. It is a phylum of one. And so ginkgos are kind of confusing because ginkgos 
look like they have a fruit. When you see a ginkgo fruit with the air, you're seeing the air quotes because it's not really a fruit. Okay. But when you see it, the seed has this like fleshy coating that is gross and it, it smells like um, rotting butter kind of, or like dog poop. Um, so people don't like having um, female ginkgo trees in their yard. Um, ginkgos are interesting because the sexes are completely separate in ginkgo trees, which is not common in, in many plants. Many plants, you know, they have both male and female, like conifers, have both male and female structures on the same plant. But ginkgos um, are separate. And so people don't typically like to plant females because they make these seeds with this stinky coating. Um, and so remember when we were doing our, our uh, plant ID, was that with you guys or was that with 63? It was with you guys, right? We did a ginkgo eventually. I think we did. Cause it was like this one. I can't easy. remember which class it was in, but I remember doing that. <laughs> That's my problem too. Anyway, so in one of the one of the classes that some of you may or may not be in, <laughs> um, and I was like, don't step on those because I didn't want you all to have like dog poo sticking shoes. Um, anyway, so that's one of the phyla, okay, that's in this, in the gymnosperms in our seeded plants. Um, and then there's these really weird guys, and this is phyla metophyta, the G is silent. Um, and so this thing, this is super bizarre looking plant is, um, called Wawichia. And these are, they're native to, I want to say it's the Saharan desert in Africa. I know it's an African desert. I don't recall which specific desert it might be the Gobi. Anyway. Okay. It's one of the African deserts. My bad for not recalling which one. Um, but what's really interesting about these, they have cones, which is kind of weird, but they're not really tree-like. And what they do is they literally only grow two leaves. And then as those leaves grow, it's really windy and there's a lot of like sandstorms and sand blowing around in the wind. And so what happens is the, um, the leaves like shred from the sand hitting them. And so it looks like there's a whole bunch of leaves coming out of this plant, but it's actually really only two leaves that just keep getting split. Isn't that neat? Anyway, um, ephedra is also in Metophyta. This is, um, used as a stimulant, right? So the common name of this is Mormon tea because um, Mormons, uh, you know, the, the back in the, I'm thinking about like, you know, back in the old West, right? Um, Mormons were some of the earliest um, people to come out to the desert essentially because they were persecuted. And so um, that's why, you know, Joshua trees are associated with them and anyway, okay. Um, they would chew on ephedra or make tea out of ephedra because it has a stimulant in it. Um, and so they, Mormon tea, they use that instead of coffee for their little pick me up, right? So no caffeine, but we're making tea out of a, out of a stimulant, okay? So anyway, so those are Nitofta. They are, um, all, they all kind of look really different. So I think when most people think about gymnosperms, rightfully, I think fairly, they think about um, you know, conifers, right? But there's all these kind of other cool guys as well. So here's some conifers, right? Because, you know, it's good to have a little variation. So there's a sequoia. There's some juniper. We have that at school, right? There's a dug fir. Okay. We didn't see any of those on our, my 63 peeps. We didn't see any of those on our trip, but we saw, um, other conifers. Okay. Um, and then of course, the, here's the little table that's like, here's all the things, right? So um, really not that many different species total of gymnosperms, but they are very um, abundant in certain parts of the world, right? So even though there isn't a huge diversity of species, there's, um, they're pretty successful. So um, the ginkgos, only the one species left, <laughs> right? There are others in the fossil record, but there's only one species left. Um, cycads, a bunch of different guys of those. Um, in Freeman, they, they split out the um, Supressophyta and the Pinophyta into two separate phyla. In Campbell, they keep them in Coniferophyta together. I don't care, right? Whatever, all right? And then the Nidophytes are those weirdos, okay? So as always, um, you know, ooh, Nabib Desert. Yeah, sorry, I, totally wrong desert. Anyway, um, read those just for, you know, kind of, entertainment and oh look there's diversity isn't that fascinating 
Okay, so we got to talk about the new hotness for a minute. So we're going to do that. So I'm going to and keep your ink annotations. Yeah, sure. Keep them for a minute. All right. So let me get out that Word document here. Okay. So list of new of um, annotations for Jim Mo's firms. All right, so what do we got? Some things you already know about. What are some of the, what's some of the new hotness here? We'll make a list. The pine cones are different, like for one female and one male. Okay, so sex, uh, sex structures, totally separate. Okay. What else? What other crazy things happen in those sex structures? They're different sizes. They're well, that's how you identify them being in different sizes. Okay. But what forms inside of them is kind of exciting right so in the male cone we produce what are we, what does the male cone make so first of all it is it has microsporangia and microsporangia make microspores perfect and then microspores make the male gametophytes so they grow into the male gametophytes and what is the male gametophyte called in these guys the pollen yes okay so that's important that's a really it, it's a key innovation i should put key innovations why is that so important why not just you know dump your sperm why, what is the benefit of having sperm inside of a little? The advantage there. Like being able to spread the, um, the gametophytes more like readily since out of water now. Beautiful, right? So now sperm are protected, right? Which reduces our dependency on water. Okay, so for every other group, the sperm needed to swim, right? And now with gymnosperms, the sperm don't need to swim anymore because they're inside of the little happy little moist pollen grain, right? And so they don't need water for sperm to swim anymore, right? And that's huge. That's huge. That's, that's real big, okay? Um, what else? So they're protected, which reduces their dependency on water. And also, that it's also like a delivery method too. Right? So those wings, those little wings that are on the pollen, help them disperse farther, right? So one of the big problems in plant reproduction is particularly if you have both male and female structures on a single individual. So even though in gymnosperms, in conifers anyway, even though there are separate male and female cones, an individual tree still has both types of cones. So it is both male and female, right? Um, how useful is it if you fertilize your own eggs? We're not really, it does shuffle the genes. So it does generate some genetic diversity, but not nearly as much, right? As you would generate if you're, you know, you have a different partner, 
a, a different individual. So one of the really, really tricky things about pine trees is you don't want to dump your pollen on your own um, female cones. So the way that pine trees get around that is they, here's my pine tree. This is one way they get around it, is um, A, their pollen have those little wings so they can fly to disperse away to a different tree. The other way is you have your um, female cones up top, higher up in the tree, and your male cones lower, so that if there isn't any wind, the males, when they release the pollen, the pollen just falls on the ground instead of falling on the female cones. Right. So ideally what happens is the female cones are getting here's another here's another tree. Right. Are getting the pollen from somebody else that's blowing over. Yeah. Has to blow over to get there. Does that make sense? Anyway. Okay. So that's a big that, that is a key innovation. What's another um, new hotness, real, real big thing that gymnosperms have that's different? Do we need to look at some pictures to remind ourselves? Would it be like the structure of how the seed is? Good, right? So that's super useful. Why are seeds so useful? What is a seed and why is it great? Right, plus our nutritive tissue right it'd be good if I could spell embryo let's try that again right um, so what's the why is that useful. It lets them like um, go when it's like necessary or when the environment is right. Right, so the embryo can wait. It can just like chillax and stay in its cozy little, you know, container with its snacks, right? <laughs> um, until, until it's time. And that can be a very long time, right? So it depends on the species, right? But can be very long time in some cases, okay? Um, okay, that coat acts as protection against animals, but that coat also can also have features that help with seed dispersal too. I should say it can protect because it doesn't always depends on what kind of seed it is right can protect against animals eating the seed and it also can um assist with can assist with seed dispersal right so there's all kinds of very cool um things that seeds can do okay what else what else is the new hotness about gymnosperms. So we talked about seeds. Right. What's another thing that maybe, I don't know, that you've noticed about plant size? Have you noticed anything about plant size? The gymnosperms are significantly bigger. They can be, right? Not all of them, right? Some of them can be, you know, smallish, fern sized, whatever. But we, we now have, you know, redwoods, <laughs> right? We have sequoias. So 
we've got some really big things in here too. Okay. So that is thanks to the evolution of wood. Okay. So before gymnosperms, nobody had wood. So that is also a really big thing that we haven't talked about yet. So let's, let's add that, right? Wood. Okay. Essentially what wood is, and we will talk more about this, you know, as we go forward, but essentially what wood is, is special um, vascular tissue that is very tough, right? And so it allows the plants to grow much taller. Okay, so wood is a real big deal too. Okay, so it's vascular tissue that is even, so we were talking with the ferns about how the vascular tissue allows them to be a little bit taller, right? But when we start talking about proper wood, then we're talking about like lots taller, okay? All right, is there anything else that we're forgetting here? I don't think so. I think that kind of hits all of our main, I'm looking through here. What kind of life cycle are we dealing with again when we talk about gymnosperms? A sporophyte dominant alternation of generation. Right. So that hasn't really changed, although it maybe you could argue it has become more extreme, right? So, um, so the the ferns and their ferns and friends, right? They all had that same life cycle, so. I'm not gonna, it's not a key innovation. It's not an innovation, it's not a new thing, right? But, um, uh, Sporophyte dominant alternation of generations life cycle has become more extreme and i'm saying that because um it the our gametophytes keep getting smaller and smaller right so in our gymnosperms our gametophyte our male gametophyte has been reduced to a tiny little pollen grain okay and our female gametophyte has been reduced to the the food the snacks inside of a seed so our gametophytes are like getting getting real small okay all right, are we cool? Any questions so far? So that's the new hotness there. Okay, so let's come back to this for a minute. They don't, they only list wood. How could they only list wood? I mean, I guess seeds is, you know, a given, I guess, but how could you only list wood? Okay, all right. So our last group of plants, woo! Our last group of plants that we're gonna be spending actually the most time talking about um, are flowering plants or the angiosperms, okay? And so flowering plants are, um, have a lot in common with gymnosperms in the sense that their life cycle is actually pretty similar. Um, but obviously <laughs> one big difference is that flowering plants have flowers. Okay, and flowers um, ultimately produce fruit. Okay, so all angiosperms have flowers and fruit. Sometimes they do not seem to us from our limited perspective to be a real flower and fruit, but they are. Okay, so all angiosperms have flowers and fruit. So we're gonna look at flower anatomy a little bit in um in lab we're gonna have a whole lab day where we just like you know are ripping apart flowers and we learn flower anatomy um and so you know we're, we'll get into that more for now though i think the most important part of flower anatomy is this all right you will notice here that we have both male and female parts on a typical flower, okay? Now, some angiosperms keep their, I wish 
and that wasn't there you know that's irritating um anyway some um some angiosperms uh, um keep their male and female flowers separated right so they're distinct from one another um some angiosperms even are completely separate plants so a male plant and a female plant are totally separate kind of like ginkgos um in you know do that as well um but the majority of angiosperms most of the ones that you see are going to be not only you know bisexual in the sense that the plant has both male and female um structures but even within the same flower okay so flowers have you know like i said we're going to go through and learn the anatomy and lab so now is not really the time where i care about that but what i will say is you have these kind of protective and or showy structures um, that are around the outside of the flower and then, and then in the middle of the flower of a typical flower is where you have the actual reproductive structures okay so flowers are all about sex that's what flowers are are fundamentally for um and so in the center of the flower we have this whole structure that is called a carpal or sometimes it's called a pistil right and so those that's the female parts and so the tip of that is called the stigma and then the skinny part is the style and then at the bottom is the ovary guess what's found inside ovaries eggs <laughs> okay so that's our that's our female parts okay um what do i want to say about that so if you're having a hard time remember remembering stigma and style the style is the skinny part the stigma is sticky right and i don't know why for some reason you know what it is i watched a one of those like horrible old like you know documentaries where um the narrator says the sticky stigma and like every time i read the word stigma i think sticky stigma it's like in my head anyway so this the sticky stigma is the tip and then the style is kind of this middle part and then the um ovary is where the eggs are going to be located okay the male part collectively that whole structure is called a stamen and most flowers have multiple stamens some flowers have only one carpal sometimes they have multiple carpels it depends on the kind of flower um but most flowers have have a number of stamens it's not just one typically um the stamen also has a, like a stick part um that's called the filament and then the anther is ultimately where we're going to make our pollen okay so that's the basic anatomy like i said we're going to talk more about this in, in lab um for the next practical not for the one that's that's coming up okay so let's do a life cycle so here's the overview of the life cycle but like we do we're gonna draw it out ourselves because if we try to just do it this way it gets sort of like mm, and it's there's eh, what am i looking at blah 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 okay so we're gonna just stop this for a minute yes keep i don't give a crap okay um and we're gonna draw Okay, so we are going to do a angiosperm life cycle. What if I could spell? I didn't need that much space. Okay, angiosperm life cycle. Okay. And since it is sporophyte dominant, I am going to start with the sporophyte. Okay. And I'm going to get my colors going. All right. I'm already red. That's excellent. Okay. So um, let's draw, let's draw a cute little, cute little flowering plant. Da -da -da. Here's a leaf. Oh, isn't this cute? It's like the kind of plant that you would draw as a kid. <laughs> and then there's some petals. Okay, actually, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to kind of draw the sexy parts, right? So there's that. There's the female part. Here's the male parts. There's petals behind this, but I'm trying to make a simplified diagram. Okay. I know it's not cute, but whatever. <laughs> Okay, so this is our Okay. All right. 
What do sporophytes make? See, I'm going to make you do this with me every single time. Every single time. What do sporophytes make? Spores. They make spores. Excellent. And how do they do that? What process? Meiosis. Beautiful. So inside the anther, right? So this is, this is supposed to be an anther. This is supposed to be an anther. Okay. Um, meiosis happens. And you end up with What do you end up with as a result of this? Do you do microspores? Yes. Why is it microspores as opposed to just spores? It's okay to say because that's what you did last time. <laughs> but yes, and, and and remember male, right? So male is the micro, male is the small one, right? So we produce microspores as a result of this. So those microspores right, are going to be found inside of the anther, okay? And then what happens to spores? What do spores do? Can you go need a fight to follow? So microspores first grow into a gametophyte. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's male gametophyte. And in this particular case, once again, our male gametophyte has a name and we call it pollen. Okay. What process? Mitosis. Right. So male gametophyte, right? But we call it pollen because that's the same. And so all of that is still inside the anther, yeah? Okay, now the pollen, I'm gonna attempt to draw a sad little pollen grain. That's not cute, but whatever. Okay, it's microscopically small little guy. And it has, this is interesting. It has two sperm and a tube nucleus, okay? So what process is it using to make those two sperm? Mitosis. Gotta be, right? I know, I'm forcing you guys to like, <laughs> <laughs> say the same things over and over again but it's, it's for your own good okay so um and then this the sperm is haploid diploid what are we dealing with here haploid All right so we're still haploid so we end up with two sperm and a and <laughs> It doesn't look like that. That's a terrible drawing, but anyway, um, right? So you have your pollen and inside of the pollen, mitosis occurs, you end up with two sperm and a tube nucleus. And so kind of like with our, do you remember our gymnosperm, how we had that little tube nucleus that grew that little tubes to deliver the sperm to the egg? We're dealing with more or less the same kind of thing here, but we have two sperm instead of just one. And that will, we'll, we'll worry about that later. So all of this is inside, right? This is all inside the, inside the pollen, right? So inside, right? This stuff is inside the pollen and the pollen is inside the anther, right? Until it's mature and it's ready to be released, okay? So we're just gonna pause on the pollen for a second and we're gonna talk about the female side, okay? So in the ovary, right? So that's our ovary. What, uh, what's happening here? What's happening in our mature sporophyte in the ovary? Yeah. 
There are megas for you. Right. So same stuff as above, just mega instead, right? So once again, it's meiosis, not mitosis. And we get mega spore. Sorry. And you guys can't see this, but I just got condensation all over my. Let me try to make it so that I can. Mega. There we go. Whoa, okay, not that far. Easy killer. Okay, get water all over my screen. So our megaspore does what? Through mitosis to produce the female gametophyte. Ugh, this is getting boring. Right, and the female gametophyte, I'm running out of room, so I'm like, mm. yeah, my to I forgot the T. <laughs> my toes is to make our eggs. Oops, wrong pen color. Let's try that again. Eggs. Yes, and all of this stays because, you know, you know how we are. Right, all of this, change my, come on, let me change my color. Thank you. Right, so all of this stays inside, right, inside the ovary. Pick the bad space to write on. Right, so inside ovary. Okay, all right, now it's time. So our sperm gets released. That was, I didn't say that correctly. What should I have said? What should I have said? What is actually getting released from the male bits? Pollen. Very good, which is the male gametophyte, right? So the pollen gets released. Um, how does the pollen make its way over to the egg? Wind. Could be, that's one option, but as it turns out, one of the reasons that angiosperms are so incredibly successful and such common plants is that um, there's all kinds of sneaky things too that angiosperms do in order to trick somebody else into moving their pollen for them. Can you think of an example? Do you know what I am alluding to? Bees. Bees, any pollinator, right? So animals that pick up pollen from one flower and bring it to another flower we call them pollinators and so bees are like you know the like go-to example but there's lots of other animal pollinators as well um and anyway it's pretty it's pretty fun manipulation actually and so we're gonna look at a bunch of like funny videos about that um later that's not gonna i don't think we're, we might get to that today we'll see um but that's you know that's some good entertainment okay so our sperm what happens is our little pollen grain, I totally can't draw this, so I'm not even gonna try, but we'll look at it on the picture. So what happens is our little sperm, right? Actually, let's draw this, I'm gonna draw, right? So the sperm, because they are being carried inside that pollen, that pollen gets carried over somewhere to where the eggs are. So the pollen, our little pollen grain, let me zoom in so that I can share, I can draw a little thing on here. Okay, so get bigger, make it bigger. Whoa, okay, that's good. Okay, so our little pollen grain, pew, 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 right? Sticks to the sticky stigma. And then a, um, that tube nucleus, grows down into the ovary, right? And there's a bunch of eggs. We don't call them all, some of them are just nuclei that we don't really call the egg. This is where it gets really, really confusing. But there's this weird, weird thing that happens. So inside the ovary, right? So I'm gonna draw my ovary, okay? We've got, 
a one egg and we have another egg right and our little tube nucleus remember our tube nucleus grows into there and then we have sperm and we have another sperm okay and so the sperm fertilizes the egg to make a to make what a zygote a zygote okay so Okay, and it's actually, there's another, I forgot, there's another one. Right, so that's, I don't wanna, I'm trying to figure out how I wanna label this, right? So that's one fertilization situation that happens. Okay, and we're gonna come back and look at what this all looks like in a second, okay? Um, but yeah, so that's one fertilization situation. And then our other fertilization situation is we have these other two nuclei that are technically not called eggs, even though they are also produced by meiosis. So they're, or excuse me, by mitosis, you know, by the female, whatever. They're produced the same way, but we don't call them eggs. Okay. And so those two together get fertilized by a sperm. And that's weird. Okay. And that, my friends, is what ends up becoming, I'm actually going to circle it in a different color. I'm going to circle it in this color. So I'm going to make the green go away. I'm going to circle it in purple because that's going to be useful in a second. So when fertilization happens in flowering plants, we call it double fertilization because there are two sperm. And one sperm fertilizes the egg and another sperm fertilizes these two other cells. Okay. That's weird. All right. So double fertilization. And essentially what you end up with here is, and by the way, let's just so that we're, you know, keeping track, right? This is the female gametophyte in here, right? This doesn't look anything like the pictures in your book, but that's okay. Cause this is meant to be like diagrammatic, right? So the, the red, is of course the ovary, right? So, ovary, right there, okay? And then inside of that, our megaspore becomes a female gametophyte. It, there's some cell division. There's ends up being a total of eight cells. Most of them don't do anything, but three of them we care about, okay? So three of them, one of them gets fertilized by the sperm and that becomes a zygote. The other two get fertilized by the second sperm and that becomes something called endosperm, okay? So now what we have inside of our ovary here is we have, where's my, oh man. I'm gonna make it real big so it's out of the way of my bad part of my screen, hopefully. Let's make it, there we go. I'll go back to, so you can see it better once I'm done drawing. No, that's not what I meant to do. Technology. I'm like constantly like technology foiled again. Okay, so there's my ovary, yeah? Okay, all this is happening in the ovary, okay? Now I got myself a zygote, right? And my zygote is from this situation here, yeah? Where my egg and my sperm fertilize, okay? And then what's surrounding the zygote now is this stuff called endosperm. And endosperm is fascinating because what endosperm is, really, really, okay, let's do it this way. I'm gonna outsmart you computer and you're bad. Now, if the college would actually like pony up the dough to get me good technology, I wouldn't have to use my own busted technology for this. Okay, so you got your zygote, right? And then it's surrounded by this layer of tissue called the endosperm. And the endosperm 
is a result of the fertilization of those two not eggs <laughs> by one sperm to make a triploid structure okay and this is different from conifers but it has the same function as the female gametophyte in conifers in that the endosperm is the nutritive tissue or as i like to call it the snacks okay and so we end up with a seed coat on the outside right our zygote which eventually you know becomes a seed coat Our zygote, which, you know, mitosis, mitosis, mitosis. So there's lots of mitosis between this and this. There's a lot of mitosis. Right. And so we end up with this whole structure collectively is a seed. Okay. Right. So this whole thing, I'm going to just kind of do it in green just so you can see it. Right. So this whole thing. No, like you, you're, you're not my friend. Okay. So this whole thing, right, is the seed. I don't need to put that in quotes. That's actually what it's called. Okay, so that entire thing. All right. Now, one of the things, one of the big things that's different between, changed all my colors now, um, between our gymnosperms and our angiosperms is that now our flower, right? So where we have this whole big flower the other parts aren't useful anymore, right? So the petals and the sepals and the anthers and the stamens and the, like all that crap goes away. And what happens is the ovary gets real big and that ovary becomes essentially, right, more mitosis, right? That ovary, becomes, how do I want to do this? There's my seed inside. <laughs> these, is, these drawings are so terrible, you guys. So bad. So, so bad. Got to change my colors back. Right, so then my little seed guy, boom, that's my seed, right? And inside of my seed, remember we had our little, now, now we're gonna call it an embryo instead of a zygote because it's getting bigger, right? But then we also, we got snacks in there too, right? Oh, wrong color, hold please. Right, now we got, yeah, so that whole thing is our seed. Okay, and then, yeah. Right. So then that seed, much like in the case of our such a bad picture. Right. That seed, much like in the case of our gymnosperm, can germinate. And when it germinates, it will grow eventually into a mature sporophyte. Okay. So now that you're looking at like the world's crappiest drawing, <laughs> let's look at the prettier picture. Right. But fundamentally, what, like I've, you know, been saying, the most important thing to me is that you understand the process, not necessarily like the detailed anatomy of like the inside of this thing. Okay. That's not really my priority. Okay. So here's our mature sporophyte. Ain't it cute? Right. And so here, the anther is the part of the flower that has the male bits. Right. And so inside the anther, you undergo meiosis to produce a microspore. This is not surprising. That microspore undergoes mitosis to produce a pollen grain. Right. Our pollen grain ends up having 
a bunch of um it, well it has a couple of nuclei in it um yeah and they don't even show you how many really because they're not showing you like the tube nucleus plus the other nucleus right they're just not it's not clear okay so we make multiple sperm in here right um and so that hangs out inside the anther until it's ready to go okay meanwhile in the female parts of the plant so here's our ovary this whole area so they're calling it bottom of carpal whatever it's ovary okay um and so here they're labeling it as ovary i don't know anyway so inside of this little structure here um we have our megasporangium and our megasporangium undergoes meiosis to make a megaspore that megaspore divides a bunch right and it specifically makes and this is actually kind of interesting right it specifically makes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight nuclei, right? So it goes under mitosis, it undergo goes under, it undergoes mitosis twice, right? Wait, is that twice or four times, right? Because the mitosis. So if we start off with one cell, we end up with eight. So it undergoes mitosis four times. So that we end up with eight cells. And then if you look at our picture here, three of them end up there. Those three don't do anything right one of them we call the egg that's right there the other two on either side of the egg don't do anything so that counts for six and then we have those two in the middle those are the ones that are destined to become the endosperm okay so double fertilization is a thing that happens right so our pollen flies over here or is delivered by a bee or a hummingbird or a friendly somebody right and those little sperm Whoop, go up and we have double fertilization so one of them fertilizes the egg and that's how we get our zygote and the other one fertilizes those two nuclei in the middle which is produces the endosperm which is triploid and that's our nutritive tissue or as i like to say the snacks right and then our little zygote starts to grow into an embryo there's our cute little embryo inside of the seed and then the wall of the ovary gets thicker and thicker and in this particular case it looks pretty juicy right juicy and delicious and that's our fruit with the seed inside and it's labeled so there's our embryo there's our nutritive tissue there's the seed coat and so the seed is dispersed some way sometimes it's by wind sometimes it's by animals there's different ways and you know it germinates blah 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 okay all right how we how are we doing <laughs> how are we doing with this it's okay i'm getting a thumbs up from natalie and denise and ariana everybody else is asleep everybody else is like we're here but not here that's okay that's fine that's fine <laughs> and jasmine thanks for thanks you guys for for you know humoring me i appreciate it i appreciate it Okay. Um, anyway. All right. So that's what's happening. Do we have questions so far? Maybe one thing that might be useful to do is to kind of like think about how this is similar and how it's different from the gymnosperm life cycle, because mostly it's pretty similar, right? In the sense that it's like, you know, it's all the same kinds of steps. There's just some different bells and whistles. Right. So maybe we'll go through it one more time, just kind of focusing on those differences. So first of all, first obvious difference is we don't have cones anymore. Right. So we're no longer dealing with stroboli. Now we have highly specialized structures um, for reproduction. OK, so no more stroboli. Um, the, the function of pollen formation is pretty much the same. That's not really that different. Um, these pollen may or may not have wings. But remember, since many of them are dispersed by animals they don't need to have extra structures for flight um and so the reason that i drew mine is kind of pokey is that actually a lot of pollen are a little bit pokey on the outside because it helps them stick to the pollinator if they have little stick me outs on them right so even this picture you can't see it very well in here but it's a little bit textured on the outside because that helps it stick to the you know bee's face or whatever okay um yeah so um so that part's really not that different other than that we are dealing with pollinators here, whereas gymnosperms generally not. Okay. 
there's exceptions to that, but you know, generally, right? We're, we're much more likely to involve a pollinator here. Okay. Um, and then in the female side of things, once again, so we don't have cones, so that's fine. Um, but otherwise the process is pretty similar, except that here when we're making our female gametophyte, it's like a very specific number of cells and there's weirdness there. Um, and so what ends up happening here, this is also different, is that whole double fertilization thing. So instead of just a nucleus, a, excuse me, instead of just a sperm fertilizing an egg to make the zygote, the sperm fertilizes the egg to make a zygote, but a second sperm fertilizes these other two cells to make the endosperm. And so in an angiosperm, the endosperm is the nutritive tissue. It is triploid, right? Whereas in our gymnosperms, what's the ploidy of the snacks? What, are, what is the, where did the, <laughs> where do the snacks come from in a gymnosperm? And what is the ploidy level of them? Um, does it come from the female gametophyte? Yes. And then they're haploid, right? Exactly. So that's really different, right? That's weird. <laughs> that's new. That's new and strange. Okay. And then of course, the other sort of new thing is the development of the ovary, the, the outer part of the ovary turns into a fruit. Okay. And um, fruits are actually much more variable than you think that they are. And like I said, we're going to do a whole lab about this, but um, fruits are. Um, a, a, right, something that happens after, there's something that happens to the ovary, right? So the ovary of the mature sporophyte changes, right, into some sort of seed delivery mechanism, right? And there's a lot of different ways that that goes down, okay? So there's, you know, for the most part, pretty similar life cycle, but there's a couple of, you know, significant differences. Right now, so this is what it looks like in Freeman. I generally like the diagrams in Freeman better. This is what it looks like in Campbell. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you. Okay, <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. Right, so um, here's our flower. Okay, oh, look, here's what's happening in the male. We have our anthers and they make microspores and then that. And then the male gametophyte, which we call a pollen grain, and then that lands in that. Okay. And then here's our female. So we've got this, you know, ovary that has little whatever, and there's a megasporangium in there. And that megasporangium is, you know, gonna gonna make the megaspore, and then right in that megaspore, then there's some division, and we end up with it. So it actually names those cells. They're called antipodal cells, but we don't care about that. And then the ones in the middle, they're called polar nuclei. And then the ones that are next to the egg are called the synergids. But I don't care about any of that. Okay, we're not going to worry about that because this is not a botany class right now. Okay, but all of those eight cells all have a name. Okay, but the only name we care about is the egg and then the other two. <laughs> and we're just going to call them the other two. Okay, so the sperm comes in. One sperm fertilizes the egg. The other sperm fertilizes the, the two weirdo cells, nuclei, I guess. Right, that's what makes our endosperm and there's a little zygote and then da 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 yeah extreme close up of double fertilization right so egg the synergids which we don't care about the name the antipodal cells we don't care about the name and then these polar ones also don't care about the name but what's going to happen here is this guy so the tube nucleus just grows the tube this guy is going to fertilize those and that's where our endosperm is going to come from and then this guy is going to fertilize that one and that's where our zygote comes from okay so there's an extreme close-up of double fertilization which i think is useful all right okay what time is it how are we doing on time what's happening here okay i have 10 ish or so minutes how am i going to use those 10 minutes i think we should use those 10 minutes to make a, hmm, let me think for a sec. Do I wanna make a new hotness list? Yeah, we'll save this for next time. Okay, so next time we're gonna talk about pollination and seed dispersal quite a bit because I got all kinds of fun and funky examples for you guys. Um, but um, for now, I wanna, I wanna make our key innovations or the new hotness list for our angiosperms. And then if we have a little bit of time, 
then we will start a tree. And if we don't, if we kind of run out of time, then we'll do it first thing on Tuesday because y'all need to learn how to do a tree. Okay. So there's my angiosperm life cycle. So now I'm going to make my, I'm going to need a new page, I believe. Insert page break. Okay. So what do I do? List of key innovations for angiosperms. make it let's make it wide okay so what were so first of all let's go, kind of go back and look at this so um what's new and what's the same well our sex structures are still totally separate so that's not new but now they're in flowers so maybe what we'll do is we'll kind of update that so Oops. Okay. Um, what else can we sort of use as a jumping off point? Um, our male gametophyte is still pollen. That's no different. So now the pollen, um, one difference is that the pollen can be moved by wind or a pollinator, right? So that's important. Okay. Um, so other than that, though, that's, you know, that's pretty similar. Okay. What else we are, the seeds are, we still have seeds, but our seeds are a little bit different. How are our seeds different now? They'll turn into fruit. Well, it's not the seed that turns into the fruit. The ovary turns into fruit. We'll come back to that in a second. But how are the seed, how is this, the contents of the seed? So remember the seed is made up of three things. It's made up of a embryo, some nutritive tissue, snacks, and a seed coat. So how is the seed of an angiosperm different from the seed of a gymnosperm? The, the nutritive tissue is different now. Yes. Okay. So how did I do it up here? Did I make a list up here? I did. Oh, look at me. Look at me. <laughs> I'm copying and pasting because why not? And that other, the bit about waiting is the same, right? That, oh, the rest of it's the same. Contain the embryo plus snacks plus a protective coat. But now the snacks are what? Three are they haploid, diploid? Triploid. Triploid. Right. I don't want to call it the female gametophyte. Yeah, I do. Right? So that endosperm comes from a sperm fertilizing two of the, I shouldn't say cells, they're technically nuclei, but. Nuclei. Um, in the female gametophyte. Yeah, and that's what produces the endosperm. Okay, and the protective coat. Um, but now we've got our fruit. Okay, so that, right? So in our, in our conifers and our other gymnosperms, our seed has that coat that protects it, but it doesn't really have much outside of that coat, except for in ginkgos, it's got this weird like fleshy dog poo smelling thing, which we already talked about, right? But for the most part, the reason that gymnosperms are the naked seeds is because this, this, the seed is naked. 
<laughs> the seed has a coat, but that's it. Okay. So now the seeds are enclosed by fruit, right? So this is big deal, right? So fruit, right, is um, so ovary grows into fruit that surrounds the seeds. And fruit is all about seed dispersal. And we've talked about this before, right? You want your you want your babies to move away someday, right? So, okay. So getting getting your offspring far away from you is important because you don't want to compete with them for resources, right? Whether it's you know water and sunlight or whether it's you know bathroom space, right? You got to get those kids out of the house so that you can have your bathroom back, okay? Anyway, <laughs> for me it's my living room. I want my living room back love my children but i would like to not have my vet, my living room be trash all the time i would like it to be an adult living room i need to buy a bigger house is what needs to happen anyway sorry okay tangent all right so is that is that cool so that's our our key innovations or the new hotness for our angiosperms let me see if there's anything else we still have wood that's not new right it's it's you know that evolved before with the gymnosperm so we have wood but it's not a new it's not the new hotness right it's you know gymnosperm level hotness um and then once again the sporophyte it's still sport we're still sporophyte dominant alternation of generations right it's just a little different so that's not new okay all right okay we should do something now we should do something Okay, here's what we're gonna do. It's not gonna be pretty, but we're gonna do it because I'm brave, I'm brave, I'm brave. Okay, any questions about any of this stuff so far? I know some of you are asleep. That's okay. <laughs> Alex is probably at the airport. <laughs> she probably might know she might be getting on a plane soon. Anyway. All right. Um, since you, since y'all are not asking questions, we're just gonna we're just gonna go. But I'm gonna need some participation here. Oh, somebody said something in the chat. <laughs> oh, you're already there. <laughs> Excellent. Alex, Alex is traveling this weekend. You're going to be, anyway, let me know how that goes. And if, I'm assuming you're going to be back on Tuesday at, at the latest, but anyway, whatever. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So phylogenetic tree for the land plants. I think we should do this. And I think that I'm going to need your, your participation. Okay. So um, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this quick. Cause I know we're like out of time. All right. First of all, who is the out group and what is an out group? So remember an out group is our closest relative that is not in the land plant category. So who is our out group? Would it be the um, bryophyta? Those are land plants, even though they're kind of sad examples of land plants. <laughs> so they're not an out group. They are in fact a land plant. Oh, would it be the, no, oh, wait, I don't know. Would it be the algae? Yes, which ones? Uh, the green algae. Beautiful, okay. So green algae, I'm gonna, now we're gonna draw it in black for a bit because we don't need it to be, or dark gray. Okay, so actually, ooh, I'm gonna be fancy. So we've got our green algae. And I'm doing them in gray because they're our out group. Right. So what that means is that they are our closest relatives to the group that we're concerned about that are not members of the group. OK, so we're going to do. Oh, man, she's making a tree. You guys, she's making a tree. 
what is happening right now. Okay, so this is the ancestor back here to the green algae plus the plants. Okay, actually, I'm going to do this. Nope, nope, change to black. Okay, now what? So now we've got ourselves four different groups of plants. What in a casual sense? So you don't need to say your your you know phyla right now. That's lab. So what do we what do we call those four categories of plants? The land plants. Within the land plants, there are four. What, do what are like they? The classification by like non-vascular. Yeah, like that. Okay, so non-vascular, vascular, and then gymno and angia. Okay, so non-vascular plants. Okay, then we have our, I'm going to write seedless vascular, just, you know. Plants. Yeah? Gymno sperms. Okay, well, that's lovely, right? Okay, so let's handle our non-vascular plants first. Actually, I don't like that line. Okay, so right here, at that little hash mark, we should make a list of some of the characteristics, the key innovations, if you will, the new hotness, if you will, that <laughs> make the non-vascular plants different from the green algae. So what things should I be writing there? I'm just gonna make my little list over here. What do, flip through your notes, y'all. Uh, the cuticle. Ah, they have a cuticle. Okay, what else do they have besides a cuticle? Pores that open and So I'm gonna say with pores or stomata, depending on, you know, which one it is, right? Because our, um, liverworts have pores and others have stomata but whatever okay what else was there anything else that was kind of useful new hotness what else was on the list i think we made this list Think, did we do this list for the first time on Tuesday? I need to look for it. You guys gonna make me look for it? I think that's oh the gosh. only thing we had. <gasps> I didn't put it on here is what I didn't do. Okay. I think you're right. I think that is the only thing that we had. Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm gonna change color, not because it matters, but just so it's easier for you guys to see on the screen. So what's the new hotness for um, seedless vascular plants? What characteristics am I putting there at that little hash mark? Vascular tissue. Right, so first of all, vascular tissue. What else? True plant organs. True organs. Okay. 
Anything else? On my list, I have that we wrote vessel elements. So that's that's the, the fancy vascular tissue in some of them. We're not going to worry about that right this second. Okay. Um, and I, this isn't really so much like a, a physical characteristic, but have we, are we noticing a change as we're going from something that is like a green al alga to a non-vascular plant, to a seedless vascular plant, as far as the, the ploidy situation, who's dominant, that kind of thing? Yeah, now with the seedless vascular, we're um, sporophyte dominant. Right, so I'm gonna go way back to this. So remember that our green algae, they didn't even have alternation of generations, <laughs> right? They were just haploid dominant all the time, right? So only my only diploid for a hot sec, yeah? Um, and, then, and then our earliest land plants had haploid dominant alternation of generations, right? So gametophyte dominant alternation of generations. And then sporophyte dominant alternation of generations. So I'm actually going to kind of, let's go where, ugh, I have too many, I have too many tabs open, like my brain, I have too many tabs open. Okay, so I'm actually going to go back. Yes, I will save you, just not right this second, be patient. Okay, so um, what did we say? Sporophyte dominant alternation of generations, because I don't have room to fit it. <laughs> Okay, and I'm going to go back in my black and say, for this one, I'm also going to say um, gametophyte dominant alternation of generations once again, because I don't have room. Okay. All right. How are we doing here? Actually, that's too long. Okay, now I know you guys are just looking at this, you know the new hotness. So once again, these colors are not significant other than I'm just trying to keep it so that you can read the diagram more clearly. So what's the new hotness for the gymnosperms? The sectors are different. So I'm going to just, the way that I'm going to say that is now everybody is fully heterosporous, right? Just to, you know, save us some words, right? So that's one of them. It's, we're fully heterosporous at this point. Okay, what else do we have? Seeds. Which is a BFD, right? Said with no sarcasm. That's a really big deal. Okay, what else? What else is a really big deal? Pollen. Pollen! <laughs> right? That's also huge. So all of these things, right? They, they in increase their ability to live in harsh habitats or dry habitats or cold habitats, right? This is all good. And there's another thing that's real important too. Wood? Wood, right? Cause you can't grow very tall. I mean, there is a limit to how tall you can get without wood. It's wood, pollen, <laughs> yeah? pick what color do I want to pick next I guess blue because we haven't done blue yet here what's new hotness for angiosperms this is gonna be a short list fruit so flowers because you know flower that's a unique setup and fruit right Okay. All right, so look at that. 
we made our own phylogenetic tree it is much messier than it would be if we were doing this in you know on the board right and you can be even neater than that because you can sit down with a piece of paper and an eraser and not a screen that's all janky and all of that okay so one of the things that i'm gonna i'm gonna go out there on a limb and i'm gonna say is one of the least popular things that that happens in this class is I love a phylogenetic tree. I, I like to make sure that we all are really clear about we're studying the evolution of these groups and how are they related to each other and what are the really like key innovations that happened over the evolutionary history, right, of these groups. So do not be surprised. In fact, you should probably expect <laughs> that I will ask you to draw a phylogenetic tree for all of the land plants, okay? Um, and remember that this is, so we're starting off with a pretty easy one, right? I'm not asking you to include every little group of plants like they do in the book. Yeah, I'm not asking you to do that because that's, that's a lot, <laughs> right? That's, that's kind of stressy, okay? But just for these four groups, the non-vascular, the seedless vascular, the gymnosperms, the angiosperms, you can do that. I believe in you. Okay, and then we can just, you know, have our green algae as our out group. Okay, now, you know, this phylogenetic tree, because they're talking about the plants that are not necessarily the land plants, they're including green algae as a plant, but you remember how we feel about that, right? So I'm saying green algae is our out group, but anyway, all right? So I think, I have faith in you that this is something that you can do, right? And you could even do it pretty <laughs> and have all the little characteristics there, right? The key innovations on those little lines, right? Now, the way that they, it's normally written, so I'm gonna just, the reason I wrote it the way I did was just for space because, um, you know, we don't have a lot of space and for clarity because I'm writing on a janky screen, right? But normally what it would look like is it would look like, okay, I'm tilting. You're gonna see my head tilting, but I can't do this. I'm here, flowers, fruit, right? Normally it's like a little hash mark and then the words next to it. Okay, but however you want to do it is fine. If you want to, one other way you can do it is you could just like make a number here and then make your list off to the side, right? If you're like, I don't, I don't want to try to make it all neat. I want, you know, I just want to like make my list of key innovations somewhere else and just put a number or a letter or something. That's fine too. Okay. Do you think that this is something that you, with practice, can do? Or is there something that you're like, I don't know how to do this. I need some guidance. As I'm undoing my hair. What's in the chat? Oh, people are saying yes. Oh, mama with practice. Right. That and that's that. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Precisely. You've got a week to practice. Okay. So here's what I would recommend to you. And I'm not going to make this a homework assignment because I'm not trying to be your mom. Okay, I'm not trying to tell you how to do what you need to do, but I will say this. Wouldn't it be nice if before Tuesday <laughs> you had all attempted to draw this from scratch with no notes, no nothing in front of you, right? And then you attempt to do it. And then if you're like, oh, it sucks, I didn't do it right. Get your notes out, fix it up, make it look good, right? It would be amazing if you could try to do one of those before Tuesday so that then if and when you run into trouble, right, you can be like, uh, here's where I ran into trouble. <laughs> Sarah, here's where I'm having a problem, right? And we can kind of like workshop the problem as a group, okay? So I'm not going to assign that because, you know, I, do, I don't, not everything needs to be an assignment. And I feel like there are different ways that people learn things. So I'm not gonna try to force that on you, but I think it's a good idea. 
Okay. So what we might do, what I'm actually thinking, I'm sorry, I'm going so over today. I'm a jerk. Um, <laughs> what we might do, you know, what? I don't care because you're supposed to be here four and a half hours for lab anyway. So whatever. Uh, <laughs> so what we'll do at the beginning on Tuesday is we will start with a um, something about the tree and just see where we are. Okay. Make sure we're good. Okay. All right. Questions? anything i'm going to stop recording i think well i'm going to stop sharing first and then i'm going to stop recording yes i want to stop